Pyrolytical Radio is online. If the NSA is listening, we can at least be entertaining. The Kate Daly Show starts now. Don't let the media, the press, or your environment brainwash you. It's not a black-on-white thing. It's not a black-on-black thing, and it's not a gang-on-gang thing. It is simply one thing. It's an ignorance thing. It's an ignorance thing. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, When I die, I won't be able to leave a lot of money behind. I won't be able to leave a lot of luxurious and fine things behind. But I want to leave a committed life behind. What kind of committed life will you leave behind? Don't be afraid to think. It's not illegal yet. Well, I couldn't have said that better than Dino, the motivational speaker, right? It was not amazing. I love that clip. It says everything about where we're at right now. We need to understand things and not have that ignorance and think while it's still legal. I love it. Welcome to the Kate Daly Show. The time is 2.07, and we have a lot packed for this hour and some great information. Uh, you'll be blown away. Anyway, welcome to the show. So we have Thomas Dykes on. Hi, Thomas. Hi there. <laughs> Hello again. You? Always fun to have Thomas in studio. I always, I'm, I'm serious. I love our shows with you. I think this is really fun. I don't know. I just, this is great. Well, I like that last week I had something planned for both hours mm-hmm. and it completely changed even <laughs> it today. That. It does that. That's and and I love that. The beast. I love that. Yeah? Actually. Unpredictability. Yeah. Well, you go with, you go with what's most important. And I think our first guest that we have this hour, um, she caught my attention. I've never met her in person, but she caught my attention on the interwebs because mm-hmm. Um, first of all, she was a mother of five, and but she was doing some political things that I thought you just don't see moms doing a lot of. Very true. And so I want to introduce real briefly Heather Gardner. She is a Utah mother of five, and she's recently had some issues with education um, regarding her children. And so I just want to introduce her. Are you there, Heather? I'm here. Oh, perfect. I'm so glad. This it, is going to be so fun. It is. It's so good to have you, Heather. Um, you've been busy even today, so we do appreciate you taking the time to to talk with Kate and I here. The way that I was introduced to you, Heather, was through the Libertas Institute in an interview that they did with you. And I thought, who is this lady? Right. She's very educated on education. Well, it was the best article I've ever read on Common Core to date. And believe me, I've read a lot. So this was actually the best article I've read because I think because you are so well informed about the tests and about what's going on and where we're at in Utah, that it blew me away. And I was directing everybody, you got to read this article. Absolutely. So, Heather, why don't you just tell us real briefly who you are and maybe about your career and your family, just whatever you feel. What like got you, you involved? Share. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm a mother of five, first and foremost, but my mother was a teacher for 25 years for the Granite School District. So, okay. I grew up in a home of a mother that taught. And then when I had my own children, um, My degree is in psychology, and I worked for the state of Utah for the Division of Child and Family Services and also did some social work. Hmm. So I'm pretty familiar with child welfare law and with, you know, courts and laws. And then after I had my children, I actually have three special needs children. So I've been working for the past 12 years to advocate for my own children to make sure that they got education that they needed. And that's really how I got involved was trying to get my children what they needed to be successful in school. So you do have quite a bit of experience in the arena uh, tied with education. Now, you did run for the state school board this past year, didn't you, or something of that effect? I did. So I put in my application to be um, a candidate for the state school board. However, I was not selected by the governor's nominating committee, and when I wasn't placed on the ballot, Judge Wadups actually ruled that the process was unconstitutional, and he allowed three more people on the ballot. And when I heard of this, I actually went down to the courthouse and filed a petition in behalf of myself and the other 40 people that were left off the ballot um, and petition that we be put on the state school board ballot, that he did not hear our petition. I just can't imagine why you were not included. <laughs> Does that <laughs> blow you away? Does that blow your mind that, that when you see how the system works and here you're trying to do a great thing and you'd be perfect for this position, isn't it amazing to you that this works and that people just don't realize this? 
Yeah, most people aren't really in tune with state school board or even local school board elections, but Mm -hmm. this year it's getting quite a bit of press because it has been ruled unconstitutional the way we do things here in Utah. And so now we're looking at the whole process and saying, hey, this is not okay and it needs to change. So I'm actually really grateful I went through that experience because now I can share, you know, what I went through, that it's just not the process the way it is, is not working. Well, speaking of what you went through, um, part of that interview, they talked about how you'd filed a former complaint, um, mm-hmm. a formal complaint against, I guess, the school that your children were, were attending. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I filed a formal complaint with the Utah State Charter School Board. Um, they're a division of the Utah State Office of Education. And basically, my complaint was against my charter school. Uh, do you want the whole story or just my complaint? Well, just just briefly, what, what was the complaint and what caused it? Mm-hmm. So what caused it is that I received a certified letter from my school in January. And they said that they had conferred with the Utah State Office of Education Law and Legislation Department and that uh, they would honor some of my requests. However, they wanted me to dual enroll my children. They did not want me to opt my children out of the Dibble test, which is a reading exam. They basically told me that legally they can't allow that. Hmm. And they told me that we were not allowed on campus if we didn't consent to have our children signing into portals on computers and following their curriculum. So in a sense, they pretty much kicked us out, told us that our option was dual enrollment homeschool, and that if we stepped foot on campus, they would assess our children. Wow. So if your kids (laughs) step on the campus, we will will force them to test. That's essentially what they're saying. They don't say it that way, but... Um, yeah. Now, Dibbles and Sage and Access, are these state-based or federal-based testing? Dibbles, as I understand it, is a state-wide test. Mm-hmm. Uh, it says, so they actually sent me a letter, the Utah State Office of Education, through my charter school. And they said that by board rule, meaning the State Board of Education, that every student grades 1, 2, and 3 will be given the Dibbles. And what's the difference between Dibbles and SAGE for those that might not understand? So Dibbles is a benchmark reading assessment, meaning Mm -hmm. that it's for children just in grades one, two, and three. And from what I understand, they're starting to give it to kindergartners. And it pretty much is for reading interventions to see if a child is on level reading-wise. The reason I'm against Dibbles is because Utah is using it as a high-stakes test. So it's being used to grade teachers and to grade a student's um, literacy. And a school can actually lose funding if students don't score well enough on the Dibbles. So I'm very against high-stakes testing. And, Do you want to uh, explain high-stakes testing and, and what that yeah. means exactly? So high-stakes testing basically means that a school will be graded based on the performance of the children on these tests. So we have the Dibbles test, which is the one I was just telling you about. Mm -hmm. And then we have the SAGE test. And the SAGE is also can be given throughout the year as an interim and then a summative test at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And based on how kids do on these tests, um, teachers will receive salary based on how the children do. Meaning if the kids don't do well, their salary could go down. If the school doesn't do well, they could get a failing grade and have the flexibility to spend their federal funding taken from them. So is this the... Go ahead, go ahead. ahead. Well, is this the first time we've done this in the last few years with the SAGE testing coming up? Is this this the first time that we've gauged the grade of the school and the teacher salaries on this testing, whereas opposed we just, we didn't do that before on the testing? Yeah, it used to be that we just had the CRT test, Mm -hmm. and they were different from SAGE. So SAGE is new, and the grading of the schools is new via legislation, as well as merit-based pay. That's also new. Hmm. So, yes, this is a new package we have rolling out. Okay. Wow. 
<laughs> well, I, it's amazing. I wanted to get your do this. well. I wanted to ask you a question um, on the Libertas interview article that you were featured. There was a, a series of questions from a commentator. Now, I often like to read the comments under articles because there are actually some very educated people out there who ask some legitimate questions. So I'm going to just ask you the gist of this question. Um, and it was the sixth one in a, a series of seven. And it said, how can a constitutionally limited government be empowered to force children to, to attend school but be denied the power to decide what school is in terms of its content methods and outcomes. Doesn't being given the first power, but not sim the second, simply give the government the power to mandate babysitting? And would the repeal of compulsory education laws resolve the conflict? And is that the ultimate goal here? So what they're saying is, we give the, the government the f authority to educate our children through the federal system, but then we say they can't be tested through that same system. And is your goal ultimately to get rid of all federal testing of our children? What, what is your end goal as a parent? My end goal really through this whole process is several fold. One is that I feel like we need to get tests in place that are reliable and valid, mm -hmm. meaning, for instance, the SAGE test. We're basically a pilot state for other states that are buying um, tests from AIR. So American Institutes of Research is the corporation that's in charge of the SAGE. So Utah for the past two years has really been kind of like the guinea pig for the SAGE test. Well, most parents don't know that. And most students don't know that. Most teachers don't know that. So I would like to see, first of all, that the test be reliable and valid. In other words, something that's been out there for quite a while that we know is testing and measuring what it really says that it's measuring. Because with SAGE, to be quite honest, I'm not sure what we're measuring. But as a psychology major, I have some major red flags going off in my head mm -hmm. about are we gathering behavioral data? Are we really gathering only academic data? Because this is a computerized adaptive test. Right. So that's one of my main concerns. So you're a psychology major as well? Yeah. I think you've been busy, girl. They've ruffled the feathers. <laughs> I think they've ruffled the feathers of the wrong mom here yeah, because yeah. you seem to be positioned and experienced perfectly to kind of confront this. But I guess going back to my other question, you, you understand how the, the constitutional process, there's nothing about education in, in that. And yet they, the federal government controls the education system per se. So right. do you feel like that's a fundamental problem or do you think that we can work within the federal system itself, or is this just going to continue to be an issue? As you know, they're, they're looking to renew No Child mm -hmm. Left Behind next week. So yeah. it seems like we can't get away from this as long as federal control's in place. How, how do you I, see that? I agree. I think as long as the federal government is trying to control education, it is going to continue to be a problem because they're dangling carrots out in front of our state and saying, here's your funding. If you don't comply with our demands, you will lose flexibility and you will lose that funding. So do I think that the federal government needs to get out of education? Definitely. Uh, I definitely feel like the states need to be in control. And even smaller than that, I feel like local education where LEAs and districts and district boards and even schools have the ability to pick their own curriculum and their own testing is the ultimate answer. So, yes, mm -hmm. do I think the federal government being involved is a problem? Definitely. Yeah. You had a very important meeting this morning. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yes. So I've been working with Senator Osmond on amending his parents' rights bill because last year a bill was passed that basically said parents could opt out of any tests that were given statewide. And what has happened is that that law has been whittled away by the Utah State Office of Education, and they've been sending out these memos over the past year that basically take away parents' rights to opt out. So I've been working with Senator Osmond on SB 204, mm -hmm. Senate Bill 204, right. to delineate parents' rights. We know parents have rights under the Constitution mm -hmm. of both the United States and the state. But unfortunately, the Utah State Office of Education thinks that they can take away those rights. 
So we, my whole family, all five kids, believe me, it was an adventure, but we went (laughs) up to the legislature Uh uh, to the education committee meeting, and I testified, and also two of my children testified in that meeting so that we could try to get some laws um, passed and also not passed. So we spent the day up at the Capitol this morning. Wow. Are you raising some rabble-rousers that are uh, standing up for their <laughs> rights before you know they even I've have them to. legally? <laughs> I have had to. I have had to tell my children, if your teacher tries to force you to do something, you call me. Yep. If your teacher takes you aside by yourself to interview you, you refuse and mm-hmm. you call me. And unfortunately, I've had to raise my children that way because they have been forced to do things and I'm done. I agree with you. My kid was forced to take a common core test and I told my kids, you know, giving giving them their power back after I teach them about respect for adults, I say, look, if they're... If something, if you're forced to take something that you know I said no to, walk out of the school. Just walk out. I will come get you. Just walk out. They, we need to empower our kids. I think kids get scared, too, uh, because they're, they're teachers. And, and this is nothing against teachers. They, they're there and they do what they do. But kids would be afraid of authority mm-hmm. figures. Yeah. And well, we so teach I think, them respect. We teach them all those things. You know? We do. And listen to your teacher. And then, you know, we're putting them in a really awkward situation. But how do we teach youth. them uh, dissent, respectful right. dissent, and when when do they know when it's right to do that? Mm-hmm. That's really difficult for children, don't you think, Heather? I do. And so let me give you two different situations. I have a fifth grader who we had opted out of SAGE testing as well as SAGE practices and an alternative exam, meaning when all the kids are taking SAGE, are they passing out a pencil and paper version of SAGE or a pencil and paper CRT to the kids that aren't taking it? And I had opted out of that in writing, Mm -hmm. which legally you're allowed to do. Well, they took all the kids away for SAGE and the kids that opted out, they gave them, I think you said it was like a 62 page paper and pencil test. Punishment. Nice. Exactly. So he said to his teacher, I know that my mom has opted me out of this. Mm -hmm. I know you emailed about this and, and this is not okay. I'm not going to take this test. Well, once again, the teacher said, by law, you know, our, we have to give this to you. We don't want you to be singled out or different. All the other kids are taking a test. You need to take a test. So my fifth grader pretends that he's filling it out, <laughs> hands the test in empty, copies <laughs> down the website on the test and brings it home oh, so wow. that we can dig into what he was taking. Oh, my gosh. So that's my fifth grader, but my third grader, unfortunately, she's younger. She's Mm -hmm. nine. Mm -hmm. Same situation. They pulled her aside. They said, you know, we're all taking the dibbles. Well, her class had taken the dibbles the week before. So they singled her out, pulled her into a classroom, and she said, same thing. My mom, my dad have opted me out of this. And actually, in this case, we sent a written refusal, which is different from an opt-out. It's right. basically saying we refuse to test. We're not just opting out. We are refusing. Mm, wow. Um, they pulled her aside, gave her the dibbles, and forced her to take it. She asked to call home, and her teacher told her no. Ooh. So you have a nine-year-old that's having to disobey their parents and choose parental and mm-hmm. state authority over her parents. And that is just wrong. Absolutely. They should have brought her down to the office. They should have had her call you. Even if there's a question mark, you should have been called. That's ridiculous. Right. Well, I, I advocate for the from the perspective. I mean, I would like to mm-hmm. cut all ties, eliminate the Department of Ad. That's an mm-hmm. idealistic thing, Heather. But technically, I think parents should have to opt in if they want their kids to be a part of the system. I don't know why the default is you're not automatically opted out unless a parent specifically wants their kids to take these. To me, that's a fundamental problem. I absolutely agree. I think it should be an opt-in system. And quite honestly, I feel like we are breaking the law, the federal law, because we are using third-party vendors. For instance, Dibbles uses Dynamic Measurement, Inc., which is a third party. It's not administered by the state. The data does not stay local. It gets sent out. Mm -hmm. And with SAGE, we're using um, American Institutes of Research. We're sending this data out. And COPA, Child Online Privacy Protection Act, says that parents need to be notified 
before their children are logged on to any type of online program or their data is shared and that parents need the opportunity to expunge that data and to opt out of those activities. So personally, I think we're breaking a federal law by administering these tests and not giving parents the opportunity to remove the data from the I, database. I agree with you. We're also breaking laws monetarily because you cannot spend state education money on federal programs. Yeah. So we're breaking yeah. the law there too. So this yep. is getting out of hand. On the test that your son took that he brought home, did you find anything on that test in particular? Was that sort of a benign, benign test or was that a test that you, sh- that you just went, are you kidding with this thing? I mean, what, what was your findings on that? So the test test. that he was given, when I looked it up, it said that it was created on UTIPS, Mm U-T-I-P-S, which is the state database for creating assessments. And unfortunately, since I'm not a teacher in the public system or an administrator, Mm -hmm. I can't log on to see what he was given. But I do know that it was an assessment. It wasn't just an assignment or like, you know, busy work. It was an actual assessment that was given to him. And it was created on a, a database that Utah maintains with the State Office of Education. So, yeah, I'm not real happy about that. Yeah. I feel like, you know, right. it was an alternative assessment, and we had opted out of that. And his teacher and the administration over there were well aware, because I immediately texted his teacher. Mm-hmm. And he said, yes, he is taking an exam. And I said, you know, fine. From now on, I'm just going to keep my kids home on testing day. Right. They're not coming to school. Right, which is like 21 weeks out of the year now. <laughs> Yeah. It's it's getting ridiculous. He was home seven weeks for an hour and a half for the testing. And that was just for the SAGE interim. So that was one test. And she was home with me for seven weeks for an hour and a half. Wow. Well, I'm sure she was happy. Um, But yeah, you you actually talk about cop. COPA and FERPA laws and um, data being expunged. But I want to share my experience. I opted my um, kids out, three of them, at a charter school. And I found out one day my daughter came home and said, Dad, I took the SAGE test all day, and this was just a few weeks ago. And I went down to school, and I had to request the data be expunged. I have to trust that it actually was expunged. My school did go through the motions or whatever they have to do. But it, it, it is a feeling of helplessness, and that's why I come back to the federal government. Um, and I just wish they were out of it because that would eliminate this problem. But I wanted to ask you one question before we finish up here. I saw a picture of you with Governor Herbert, and as we know, that's his mantra, education. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's just so big into that. And I actually asked him one time, would he ever consider us being opted completely out of the federal education system? I won't share the answer he gave me, but you can probably guess what it was. What has your conversation? Yeah, yeah. got us into this mess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I saw you with, with Governor Herbert, but I saw you with Senator Osmond. What have your conversations been with uh, or been like with these individuals that are in power? Do you have any hope there? Uh, Governor Herbert, I don't really have a whole lot of hope because mm-hmm. he's the vice chair of the National Governors Association, which is actually kind of who's driving the Common Core yep. train here in the United States. They do like that Gates so, Foundation money. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yes. So they like the money that comes from Bill Gates. They like the funding. Uh, they like Agenda 21 and this whole idea of globalizing education. They like the corporate interest. So with Governor Herbert, I don't know that we will be getting out of this anytime soon. He likes to tout local control, but in reality, he's very in line with the National Governors Association. Well, we need uh, someone my that's not a wuss. With him, yeah, go ahead. We need someone that's not a wuss in this in this <laughs> venue. I mean, honestly, we need somebody that's not wussy that actually goes strong for education, actual local control. And he is. He's wussy, right? Yeah, go ahead. Right? Yeah, he says local control, but not really. And also, interestingly enough, mm-hmm. I did a grammar request for mm-hmm. some of the records from the state, and the records that I got back were. The um, commentary for the math and reading Common Core standards and curriculum. You go, and Governor girl. Herber and wow. the AAG have said, oh, this is great. The state loves it. The parents love it. There's no problem with it. Well, I went through all the comments. There was like 7,000 comments, and that's really not the case. So they're not giving us a clear picture of how our state really truly feels about Common Core. 
You or grammar requested. You grammar requested. I love you. I think you're great. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You're willing to go there. That is just, I don't know. It's just awesome. Well, and, and to me, the withholding of the full picture harkens back to a year or so ago when we found out that our assistant superintendent of education had sold our kids yeah, out $5 essentially for $5 million to Florida. To me, that was such, and, and I think she's still in power. Mm-hmm. Um, Judy oh, she Park. got a slap on the hand. I mean, it was nothing. Yeah, it was so almost like, we're proud Judy of you. Park. Yeah. yeah, Judy Park is another one I have a big beef with because her name has been on all of these opt-out memos from the Utah State Office of Education. Yep. I really, truly feel like she's trying to take away parental rights here in Utah. Um, and there's been zero accountability in, in my situation and in other situations where parents have been bullied. So there's not much accountability there. The other person I've had some conversations with is Senator Stevenson. He and I worked on some autism legislation together for quite a few years. Mm-hmm. And I had this conversation with him two years ago. I said, look, Stevenson, FERPA has been stripped. Our children's data is being shared. It's being sold. It's out there. We're doing computerized adaptive tests on special education kids at their grade level. They just can't do it. Right. They can't. A kid who's developmentally on a third grade level can't take a fifth grade test. I agree with because you. Because they're fifth grade age. Yep. So he knows my concerns. We talked about this, but he is also very much driving legislation here in Utah that is in line with Jeb Bush's agenda, with mm-hmm. Common Core agenda, and with digital learning. Isn't, so, isn't he from Draper? Yeah. Isn't he Draper? Yeah. Yeah, he he's is. too busy trying mm-hmm. to figure out if unconscious people should have sex. That's the whole problem with him. He's a little <laughs> too busy on other matters. I, you know, I, I just find this so incredulous that parents are having to fight tooth and nail on a daily basis to make sure that we have rights. We weren't doing this five years ago. I know that Thomas had a question for you uh, before yeah. you go, though. Well, how do we, and, and we do appreciate you coming on, um, how do we get individuals like you and, and other par- parents who really care on the state board? Um, how do we get you to control the UEA and these organizations that, you know, we need, we need more right. independent, true independence, not low, you know, federal control. How do we right. get you on the so, Utah State Office of Education Board? I would love to be on the State Office of Education Board. I tried my darndest to get on that ballot. <laughs> I think, honestly, we need to support bills like um, Senator Al Jackson's Partisan School Board Election Bill for both local and state office. Mm-hmm. Do I believe those elections should be nonpartisan? No. I think they should be partisan so that those candidates can be vetted in a proper manner and so that we can know exactly what the people on our school board are standing for and what their agenda is. I agree with you because we didn't have that luxury. They got vetted for Common Core before they made the ballot and everybody thought we were making a choice. We weren't. Right. Well, it seems if you follow really closely the PTA Mm -hmm. and the UEA and some of those organizations on social media like Twitter or Facebook, you can get a really clear indication of what they support and what they don't support. So that would be my suggestion to everyone is, do you really support the PTA? Do you really support the agenda? I've been on the PTA board and I had no idea what their agenda was on a national level. Right. So just do your research, do your homework before you stand behind something, really look into it. Well, we want to thank you for coming on, um, Heather. We appreciate all the work you've done, not just as a mother standing up, but actually getting your kids involved and then doing all this research and uh, no, she's one smart cookie. You really petitions. need to be on that board, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> it's, it's great to you see really that. And, and as I say, also on the local level, be involved in your kid's school. Don't turn teachers into demons, you know, or that they're the enemy. Be they're involved, not. become friends with them, try to have a relationship. Would you, would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. We have had some awesome teachers, and I just want to make that clear that I'm standing behind teachers, not just parents, because I myself am a teacher, and I stand behind teachers. I've had several teachers in the last two weeks come up to me and say, we can't talk about Common Core, we can't talk about SAGE, we'll be fired. Yep, I've heard the so, same thing. you know what, teachers, stand up. Yep. I know we don't have a real strong union or a real strong voice, but we're... Why are we limiting freedom of speech here in America? Right. Why do we feel threatened? Why, why are we allowing why we, that? Yeah. Yeah. I, exactly. I totally agree with you. So and our, they're put in an awkward you know, situation. Get involved. 
Yeah. Go to the legislation and the Senate meetings, and you will get a very clear picture of where education is heading in the state and in the nation if you attend those things. So, Heather, one last question, because, of course, the obvious question then is going to be, and I've had this question directed at me, too, uh, by text and email, why are you homeschooling now? Are your kids out of public school, or have you kept them in? I tried to keep two of my children in public school. They really wanted to stay where they were at, Mm -hmm. uh, at Legacy Preparatory Academy. Unfortunately, after my daughter was forced to take the dibbles, she was scared to go back. And so I did remove all of my children from the public school system, and we are at a private school. So I'm paying for my children's education. Twice. You're paying for public and you're paying for private. Right. Uh, I'm paying basically for my rights unfortunately, because I do not believe in Arnie Duncan's agenda, and nor do no. I think it's constitutional. Right. No. I, I agree with you. I agree with you now. And we're going to have to be discussing all these medical institutions propping up, uh, cropping up, I'm sorry, at uh, places like Hurricane Middle. All of a sudden, we have a medical institution across the street, you know, to take care of those pesky little needs while the parents are at work. And I, I my heart sank. I just thought, is this where we're headed now because of Arnie Duncan? So Give them some birth control yeah. and some education. Christmas. Right? Yeah. So It is. Let's make the school the center of the society with the community help and everything else. Well, I think Carl Marx would. Heading. I yep. think Carl Marx would agree with that. So. <laughs> I think so too. Yep. <laughs> oh, for shame! All right, thank you, Heather. Heather Gardner, we sure appreciate you. No problem. Thanks so much Thanks. for having me. Hopefully, on. you'll come back. We'd sure love to yeah. hear. There's so much we could cover. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> appreciate that, Heather. Appreciate all that you do. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, All right. That was Heather Gardner, and uh, she lives up north, and I'll tell you, she's a go-getter. Wow. She's got them running up there in circles, and I love it. Well, you see a little mom with five kids, and you think, oh, she's, you know, just a regular Jane, like, no, she's a force to be reckoned with. Oh, definitely. We're going to come right back. We'll pay some bills. We'll be right back. Talk lines are open now. Call 888-673-1450. This is the Kate Daly Show. to the Kate Daly Show three days till Friday. Yes, we do the countdown (laughs) starting early now. It's Tuesday, The man. time is 2.42, exactly, three days till Friday. I've got Thomas Dykes in studio with me. We've also got a caller, so let's go ahead and take the caller. Hi, caller. Welcome to the show. Hey, Kate. Hi yeah, there. I've been listening the last uh, 30 minutes. Excellent. Excellent. Topic about education. Yes. What do you think? What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are, is, is you know, we've been fighting this battle, and it's a good battle for 30 years, but mm-hmm. um, I think that the powers on the other side and the amount of money that's involved, there's just no way to win it. I think the tactics today is, is that we try to establish a really good private system yep. for those that don't want to homeschool. I agree. I think it's insurmountable to go against it. So, you know, people need to hopefully get a good education and get a good mm-hmm. job so they can afford private schools for you, their kids. I agree with you. And you know what? I would even take it to this level because I've thought about this. I would love to see community schools, you know, like a Washington City school or a uh, St. George school where communities come together and teachers that have knowledge in certain areas teach for free and kids are able to get instruction maybe three, four hours a day. And they also can use local churches that stand empty every single day that have buildings and facilities for kids to go to school in a sense, right? It's an option. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. Um, so, other, other than you'd have the powers that be, you know, fighting you tooth and nail to use those facilities and get, you mm-hmm. know, accredited. Right. I, right. I watched yeah. that on a different Appreciate level. Appreciate your call. Thank yeah, you thank so you, much. Yeah, um, thank you for listening. I watched that on a local level. I had a friend who started a, a private football league versus the city football league for mm-hmm. kids, right. and and he struggled to be. It's hard, to get isn't it? it? Going, it's hard yeah. to get an edge in. Hi, caller. Welcome to the show. Hi. Hi uh, I was just thinking when you hear about schools and teachers who are making students comply with them over their parents, it seems very reminiscent of the Cultural Revolution in China yep. and parents being turned in by their children 
I agree with you. Scary stuff, is it not? It's scary. It's really scary, yeah. And uh, we've got to be able to do something about this. And the, the, the sad part is, caller, I think we just have to scratch and claw our way through weekly problems with these bills coming out that seek to say, we are wonderful, look at us, we're giving power back to parents. But if you look at the terms and conditions, that's not so. It's sad that we have to sift through 600 pages of bills to tell our legislators what to do and how to vote. They should be doing their homework and they should know what's inside these bills. We're having to scratch and claw our way through them. And this is, this is sad. It's sad. It is. And it makes you wonder if they really do know what's in them and that's what they want or if Mm. they're just being duped. Yeah, just ignorance, really. All right. Thank you. I appreciate your call. Great comment. What do you think? I think that you should give politicians credit. Um, The conditions we've had have been created for a century and a half at least. And so all of the war, all of the educational system, everything we should accept that that's what is wanted. Um, When you look at the lives of people like John Dewey, if you've heard Mm -hmm. of the Dewey Decimal System, these were people who signed the Humanist Manifesto several decades ago, which were hugely influential in education. They did want the state to raise the kids. And one of the first things that a communist um, dictatorship does is they eliminate religion. And religion fundamentally, especially Judeo-Christian uh, theology makes us individualists. Mm-hmm. We are individualists at our core, and, and American America was built on that individualism. But a state-based school system kind of weans that out of kids. Our kids are trained for college and for jobs. When in America, the American experience was entrepreneurialism, being an owner, mm-hmm. being Georgic, working with the land, um, being an apprentice, and then learning to, to mm-hmm. run your own business. And so that's really changed. Um, in 1900, you had about 90% of the country which were actually owners. Mm-hmm. Today, that's less than 10%, according well, to my stats I've read. So the education process we have now from the top down is about college and jobs. That's so true. How different, let me just take you on a little road trip. How different would America look if... The government had not tried to take over our education system. And you moved to the city that you moved to because you liked the way they taught, right? Because you loved the educators and the system in which they implemented locally and they implemented the instruction. And you could move to the area of your choosing based on what they were teaching there and how they were teaching their kids. Also, what about a community that was armed in case uh, all the communities across America were armed in case an intruder, uh, somebody that came over, a terrorist, what have you, into America that we could arm ourselves and actually defend ourselves? What would our situation look like if we weren't competing for government jobs and used, actually use the Yellow Book test and actually cities were comprised of private business where government spent taxes on a certain amount of, of things that they were supposed to and not competing with, with businesses? How different would America look right now? Well, you're talking about the concept of Republican wards, which Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson wrote on extensively about self-contained rural communities. Alexander Hamilton and him debated about Alexander Hamilton wanted big cities where you could have greater control because he believed in that. But Thomas Jefferson said, no, we need more rural development and and communities that are uh, self-sustaining, self-discipline, self-restraint, self-determination. It's all about the self. And as we, you know, get more collectivized, which I don't think we realize how collectivized we are in our mentality nowadays. The fact that we're afraid of guns. Well, guns used to be a um, symbol of Mm self-defense. Now it's, well, we're afraid of them and we want to control that. I mean, that's just one example. But this is going to be a challenge, Kate. You talk about private education system. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of our friends up north have tried to get a bill passed for two years, now giving a $500 tax credit to the parents of homeschoolers for each kid. Well, who came out against the bill? All of the powers that be in education came out against the fact, they said it was dangerous, that we want to give homeschooling parents tax credits because their kids aren't even in the system. But, but they're the, paying for it. It's a collectivist mindset that, well, it's for the greater good and it's the social contract and you know we, we're educating everybody else's kids. So the challenge will be 
pulling away from that system. And as a parent, you know, I struggle with that myself. My kids are in the government system. So right. it's, it's a challenge that I think about a lot. Yeah, I get that. But to give, to get the IRS to even give up an inkling of what they're going to get, <laughs> I don't know, maybe we're fighting the wrong battle. We've just got to just maintain and make sure that as we talked about yesterday, the uh, SSA, I think it's SSA bill, yeah. uh, make sure that private schools um, still have their ability to uh, have religious freedoms within the schools and all of those things, because Frankly, I don't think we're going to get tax credits for homeschoolers. I really don't because there's the powers of be will never let that happen. They want every grimy, grungy little dime that they take. Hi, caller. Welcome to the show. Hi, Kate. Hi there. Hey, um, you know, this is a great conversation. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the churches being empty a lot. Right. You know, St. George is in a position where if they really worked and got the parents behind this, mm -hmm. they could create a school system here I totally in the agree. LDS churches. You're absolutely right. 100%. I wish we could. I don't know what stops us. I don't know what, uh, if there's laws that are stopping. I don't know. I don't know. I can't believe there. If you can take your kids out of school and homeschool them, why can't you call it homeschooling? <laughs> <laughs> there are some commonwealths. Like yeah. There are some commonwealths that, mm -hmm. in fact, our next guest next hour, his kids are in a commonwealth. Right. Where you get private. together with a group of people doing the same like mindedness and uh, and you designate certain teachers on certain days and people can volunteer their time to teach. And it's actually a pretty great scenario. I was just saying, man, if I got big enough, use the schools because it has restrooms. It has a gym. It has all the classrooms. I mean, they're set up perfectly. There's no reason well, not to. The, the hard part is convincing people that it can be done. True. Absolutely. You're right. And, You're absolutely and they, right. they need to believe that it can be done and that it's going to be better for their children. We're only a couple generations away from total government control once they have our children. I totally agree the way this is going. Oh, my gosh. The Common Core has honestly steamrolled over parents' rights just in the last year and a half because a, a year and a half ago, we were told that it was just a couple of weeks at the end of the year that you would have to opt your kid out of testing. Now it's 21 weeks in a year. 21 well, weeks? And, I mean, And that's an issue crazy. for me. It, it, we seem to be sitting back often talking about how we're lied to by bureaucracies mm -hmm. and that government officials. We're constantly being lied to. We catch them in an outright lie. And yet we don't do anything about it. Yeah, I agree. If they're lying to us, how are we ever going to disseminate the true information to the public? Great point. Can't argue with that. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, it's a great question. Thanks. Well, it, it has to be done locally. It's true. Absolutely. It's true. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Appreciate yeah. the comment. All right. We will be right back more with Thomas. Tuesdays with Thomas Dykes. When we return, he's from political. Poli uh, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Pyrolytical. Where did my brain go? It's Pyrolytical awkward. radio. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Have you heard about the lonesome loser beaten by the queen of hearts every time? Have you Hi there. Isn't that song seriously validate this whole hour? Not loser part, but lonesome because you feel like the lone voice. Welcome back to the Kate Daly Show. And that's how people feel when they're fighting the Department of Education. Uh, even <laughs> within the state, you feel like you, you're just, you just keep trying. You just have to keep trying. I'm in studio with Thomas Dykes. And uh, so glad to have him on board today. We had a great hour with Heather, Heather Gardner. We did. We had a really good hour. And before the, the break comes on us, I just want to say that next week, the House of Representatives will have the opportunity to vote on this, quote, Student Success Act, end mm -hmm. quote. I love these titles. And it has to do with private schools, more or less, right. more so. Well, HR 5, and it's it, the major thing that it does is reauthorizes the No Child Left Behind Act till 2021. And I just want to say, go on the record, for you Utah representatives that vote for this, you are betraying Utah parents and kids. And I would say wow. unequivocally, Ouch. do not vote to extend No Child Left Behind because it is the garbage that helped to set up the conditions for Common Core. It's always processional. Amen. Always processional. You have one step leads to another. So do not support HR5, please. I'm begging you as a parent, but I'm saying as a voter, I, this will be one of those pivotal things that will cause me to uh, work for your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> If you vote for it. <laughs> I love your honesty and your candor. I actually appreciate what you just said. And I don't think most people realize that that was a garbage bill. And uh, HR 5 is totally...
total garbage. Please call Congressman Stewart and let him know how you feel about it. Please. Those calls represent a thousand voters. You are calling for a thousand voters when you call. Is it, is it worth the three seconds that you have to talk to him? Yes, because it's worth a thousand votes to him. Call up, please, and tell him no on HR5. Thomas Dykes and I will return. We'll have Stephen Palmer on as well. Boy, what a fun hour this is going to be. What a fun show today. <laughs> we'll be right back. Stay with us. You're listening to Fox News, The Kate Daly Show.